This is part two of a conversation on the Treaty of Waitangi called Five Minutes with Professor Paul Moon, the AUT history professor and author of 26 books on New Zealand history. In the first clip, Paul answered the query, why was the treaty written? One point he made was that Britain was almost an accidental coloniser. The British Empire, leading into the 1840 signing of the treaty, was reluctant to intervene in New Zealand. But the British population was growing with Wakefield's shady immigration scheme of selling land to British settlers. The colonial empire had to sign a treaty with Māori chiefs. And this is where the story gets complexly detailed and historically significant. It is true to say the British recognised the sovereignty of Māori chiefs because, as Paul noted, this was the requirement for signing a treaty between sovereign states. Their agenda was to exercise legal jurisdiction over British citizens, bringing them under British law in New Zealand, a land and sea that was not quite a colony of Britain by the treaty, but something else. What was that something else? And how could it evolve into anything else but a settler colony of European immigrants in the 19th century world. Immigration shaped the thinking and practice of the British settler colonies, New Zealand, Australia and Canada. It was the ideology of modern nation that remained in the 20th century and intensified in the post 1970s era with mass migration from non-Western regions such as the Pacific Islands, Southeast Asia, especially India, and Asia's leading country, China. The sociologists and demographers have embedded this historical factor in their story of the nation to a greater extent than Paul Moon and the historians Paul Spoonley, Massey University sociology professor, and Richard Bedford, retired AUT demography professor, co-wrote their book in 2012, Welcome to Our World, Immigration and the Reshaping of New Zealand. They highlighted that New Zealand is one of a small group of countries regarded as the classic immigration society or traditional settlement country. Immigration and settlement situate New Zealand in modern history. Here they write, British and Irish settlers dominated migration to New Zealand to a, to a degree that was unique. Through a colonial period and until the 1970s, immigration from the UK and Ireland was the overarching story of New Zealand's experience as an immigrant society. Immigrants from other countries arrived, but they were often sojourners, Chinese migrants, and individually or combined, these groups did not exceed the UK-Ireland immigrant born before 1991. I have personal reasons for poking the history professor to say if the treaty triggered the floodgates of British and Irish immigration to New Zealand, I am the direct descendant of a British immigrant from colonial times. I have his surname, Brown. My mother inherited British citizenship. Through paternity, I carry enormous guilt, feeling the Scotsman's migration worsened Māori problems with land, swindling settlers. Why did he come here? Was the United Kingdom so bad that risking everything, even your life, immigrating to a South Seas colony seemed like a good idea? What social and political conditions did settlers escape from in Europe? This is Five Minutes with Professor Paul Moon. What happened after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed? Okay, the final article of the treaty gave Māori the same rights and privileges as British subjects, but it didn't make them British subjects, and that's an important point. So Māori sovereignty was kept intact as the British colonial office had intended after the treaty was signed. Things changed gradually. In early 1842, the first Māori was executed under British law for committing murder. And that was a sign of British jurisdiction extending beyond its own subjects in the country into Māori communities. Hobson died in September 1842, and in 1843 his successor, Robert Fitzroy, arrived as the new governor of the country. Fitzroy took a more sympathetic view towards the treaty. It was noticeable towards the end of Hobson's rule that the treaty seldom got mentioned in correspondence. 
seldom was the basis of government decisions. It was almost as though it was the, the key that unlocked the door to British rule in New Zealand. Once the door was unlocked, the key was no longer needed. Fitzroy, as I say, took a, a more sympathetic view. In fact, he organised the first treaty settlement in 1844, returning land to Hapu and Iwi that had, had it, that had been purchased from them in a dubious way. Fitzroy became very unpopular with the settlers because of that. In fact, they petitioned the British government to get him fired, and that's essentially what happened. In 1845, he was withdrawn, which was a cause of huge embarrassment for him, but was an indication of how the settlers felt about the treaty. His replacement was Governor George Grey, who took a very dismissive view of the treaty. And from that point onwards, from 1846 onwards, the treaty really slipped from view as far as the government in the country was concerned. And that remained the case more or less up until about the 1970s. So it was this big period in New Zealand history where the treaty just didn't feature as a basis of government policy.